Well, good morning. Hope you're well. Someone's awake. That's good. So we're thinking again about uh, singleness, and today we're going to be thinking about some of the ways I think we typically misunderstand singleness in the church today. Uh, There are certain misconceptions in life that just don't seem to go away. It doesn't matter how much you explain facts, people still end up with misconceptions. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, People think that the Great Wall of China is visible from space. It isn't, okay? It's a wall. Uh, just making it long doesn't make it suddenly visible from outer space, okay? That's, that's just, you know, let's put that one to bed. Uh, people think sometimes if you shave, it will make your hair grow back thicker. False. Otherwise, people wouldn't go bald. You would just keep shaving your head and hair would grow back thicker. So let's get rid of that one as well. And here's the, the one that's going to occupy us for this morning. Singleness is, is bad for you. Uh, that's a, a kind of idea I think we see around us uh, in many areas. Singleness, as we were seeing yesterday, as defined by Jesus, is not merely the state of not being married, but it's being committed to the Bible's teaching on sexual ethics. Singleness involves being celibate, being abstinent, being chaste. And if those words all sound unfashioned, it's because we don't have any contemporary concepts of those things. And so to describe them, we have to borrow language from the past, but that is what the Bible means by singleness. And our world would say that that kind of singleness is bad for you. And so we have movies like The the 40-Year-Old Virgin, where the very premise of the movie, that a guy can still be a virgin aged 40, is meant to be comedic. It's just absurd and laughable. Or there's a movie like 40 Days and 40 Nights, I haven't seen it, but the the kind of strap line is, one man is about to do the unthinkable, no sex whatsoever for 40 days and 40 nights. That is unthinkable. Like I've been single for for 43 years, I don't think that movie maker's gonna have a word for just how absurd my life must be to them. So our culture will say that actually to be sexually absent is, well, at best it's laughable, but at worst it's probably really bad for you because our culture would say that you can't experience what it means to be truly human unless you are fulfilling your sexual feelings. And so to kind of hold back from that aspect of life actually is, is harming yourself. You're only leading a, a kind of shriveled existence. So that's where our culture's at. But actually, look at how Scripture says the same, uh, sees the same issue. Uh, Jesus, for example, let us remember, the most fully human and complete person who ever lived was not married, was never in a romantic relationship, and despite the claims of certain novels, never had sex. And so we cannot say that any one of those things is essential to human fulfillment, otherwise you diminish the humanity of Jesus. You really want to look Jesus in the eye and say, you weren't really a full human being. Okay, the Apostle John's word for that way of thinking is antichrist. So the moment we make sexual fulfillment or romantic fulfillment or marriage the kind of (coughs) essential non-negotiable of being a real human being, we are dehumanizing Jesus Christ. Or think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We've only got time to kind of glance at this, but this would be a great passage to to just work through uh, more carefully on your own. Uh, Look at how Paul describes singleness. We tend to, to think of singleness as being primarily the absence of good things, the absence of the good things about being married. So we even refer to single people as being unmarried. We don't refer to married people as being unsingle. But we kind of define singleness by the good things that you don't get by virtue of your singleness. Listen to how Paul describes what singleness is is the absence of. Paul says in verse 28, yet those who marry will have worldly troubles and I would spare you that. Okay, Paul is not down on marriage. Some of the most 
beautiful things that the Bible has to say about marriage are written by Paul. Paul has the highest view of marriage, but he's also got a realistic view of marriage. And he says, listen, part of the package of being married in this world is that you will have certain troubles. I can think of friends of mine who have uh, been bereaved even in their 30s or 40s. I think of one family I know who have lost, uh, seen two of their own children dying. I know others whose spouse has abandoned them or been unfaithful. I know people whose children are walking away from the Lord. Some very, for me, unimaginably painful things to go through. And those are particular pains I will never have to look at directly by virtue of being single. So Paul wants us to be aware that sometimes I think we we tend to compare the downs of singleness with the ups of marriage. And we forget that there are downs of marriage and there are ups of singleness. So again, not one for your anniversary card or if you're getting engaged to someone, I wouldn't start it off by saying, hey, let's have some worldly troubles together. But Paul just wants us to be aware that that the switch from singleness to marriage is not the switch from problems to no problems. It is the exchange of some of the challenges of singleness for some of the challenges of married life and family life. But Paul also then shows what singleness frees us up for. Singleness spares us certain things, but it also frees us up for certain things. So verse 32, Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. That's great, isn't it? (laughs) It's lovely. Paul wants us to be free from anxieties. He's on our side. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, it's not wrong to get married, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Paul says if we are single, there is a sense in which our devotion to Jesus is undivided or can be undivided. In other words, by by virtue of being single, we're, we're being pulled in fewer directions than would be the case if we were married. There's a capacity and a flexibility you have if you're single that you won't have if you're married or at least you shouldn't have if you are married. So I see this with, you know, if if something comes up and I need to do something fairly last minute, drop everything, go and visit someone who's, who's in need. The, the, the amount of time it takes me to leave the house is typically eight minutes. Um, contrast my friend who's got three young kids, watching his family try and get from inside the front door to outside the front door is about a 90 minute exercise. Uh, one kid has one shoe on and the other one is, is doubling up as a, as a mitt. Uh, the other one can't find his coat or has put his legs through the armholes. Uh, one, one of the kids is finally got his coat and, and shoes on. He needs a toilet, so he's then got a, un, you know, and it just goes on and on. It's, it's crazy. I've seen families spend entire days trying to leave a house. <laughs> By the time they get outside, it's dark and it's bedtime. But there's a sense in which if you're, if you're single, you can kind of turn on a dime. If you need to go and do something, actually it's relatively easy. We have a capacity and a flexibility by virtue of being single. And Paul reminds us the point of that is not great, I can now do what I want to do. The point of that is to help us be devoted to Christ. It's not there so that we can serve ourselves and be selfish and self-centered in our singleness, but so that we can be a blessing to the kingdom so that we can serve Jesus, so that we can serve his people, so that we're using our singleness not for ourselves but for others as a means of service. So therefore singleness is not a bad thing. It spares us certain trials and troubles and it frees us up to be devoted to Christ in a way that would not be possible if we were married. So that's the first misunderstanding about singleness. Singleness is bad for you. Uh, The second one is this. Singleness requires a special calling. 
Now, you may have noticed that there are, you know, one or two superhero movies kind of doing the rounds these days. Um, seems to be pretty much the only thing showing at the moment. And as far as I can see, what happens is they'll make a superhero movie, they'll make a sequel to the superhero movie, they'll make a sequel to the sequel of the superhero movie, then they will reboot that superhero and do a sequel to the reboot, and then they'll get all the other superhero characters together in the same crossover movie, make a sequel to the crossover movie, make a sequel to the sequel of that, then reboot the whole of that, and then make a sequel to the reboot of the crossover movie of the reboot of the original. You know, it's kind of, kind of crazy. All of which is to say, we're kind of fascinated by superhero characters. And I think people's primary category when they think of singleness is they assume, because they've assumed singleness is bad, they assume that the only way you can survive singleness as a Christian is if God gives you some kind of spiritual superpower. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 refers to the gift of singleness. And so for many people today, they assume, aha, the gift of singleness, that's the superpower. Because singleness is bad for you, the only way you can survive it is if God gives you some unusual endowment or weirdness that means you can flourish as a single person. But because it's bad, you have to have that special, exclusive gift of singleness. So it's a way of saying, what well, singleness can be difficult, but some people seem to have the unusual capacity to flourish in their singleness. That's not the case necessarily for all single people, so that must be the gift of singleness. Which means there's a whole category of Christians out there saying, I'm single, but I don't have the gift of singleness. And I've lost count of how many believers I know have justified unbiblical forms of relationship on the basis that, well, I don't have the gift of singleness and this is the only option that's available right now. So it's God's fault because he made me single but didn't give me the gift of singleness so therefore this is my way of responding to that situation. That can't be what Paul is meaning. For one, it still assumes singleness is so terrible that you've got to have some special capacity to cope with it. But what's to stop someone saying the same thing about marriage? If they're going through a difficult season in marriage, what's to stop someone saying, well, I know I'm married, I just don't think I have the gift of being married. So therefore, I'll just walk away. It's getting a bit tricky. It's a bit of a challenge. I'll just ditch the whole marriage thing because I don't have the gift of being married. Other people do have the gift of marriage, and that's great, but I don't. So therefore, I'll, I'll justify marital unfaithfulness or abandonment or whatever it might be because I don't have the special calling to be married. That is not how God works. We can never use one bit of scripture to justify disobedience against another bit of scripture. No, when Paul talks about the gift, he's saying this. He talks about his own singleness and says in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 7, I wish that all were as I myself am. There is a sense in which Paul was saying, I'd love more people to be single. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So Paul is thinking in terms of gospel strategy, it'd be great if more people were single, but everyone has their own gift. Some have the gift of marriage, God enables them to be married. Other people have the gift of being single. Either way, you have a gift. Your singleness is a gift or your marriage is a gift. And therefore, it levels the playing field. We, we mustn't sort of think, well, if only I was married, that would be the solution to all of my struggles and woes in life. That is to deny the gift of your singleness. Similarly, if you're married and it's, it's tougher than you anticipated, again, it's tempting to think the grass is greener on the other side and to think, you know, singleness, wow, that's a gift, marriage isn't. No, Paul wants us to realise the gift is not whether we feel we have the capacity to be single or feel we have the capacity to be married. It is the status of being single and the status of being married. 
Both are gifts. Both are an expression of God's goodness. Both are a means of serving him and of testifying to his grace in Christ. So whichever situation you find yourself in long term, you have the goodness of God. You don't need to be married in order for you to feel as though your life now works. Because for as long as you are single, God is giving you the gift of being single. And it is a gift. So marriage is a, is a good thing to desire. It's a good thing to pray for. It's a good thing to be, to be wise about how we think towards. But it doesn't ultimately matter if I get married or not. Either way, I receive the gift from God of either being single or of being married, which is great. We can be thankful either way, challenging though it may be. So that's the second misunderstanding. The third is this, that singleness means no intimacy. This is perhaps the most common uh, misunderstanding about singleness. I was speaking to a, a pastor who's kind of I would say less biblical in his thinking about a lot of areas of uh, the Christian life. And he said to me that by calling unmarried people to be celibate, you are making people live a life without love. So I said to him, I'm not normally this confrontational, but I said to him, listen, if you are saying the only way to have love is to be married, then your church stinks. And what he was saying was reflecting again something of our own culture. Our culture has so collapsed its view of intimacy into its view of sex that it can't conceive of intimacy that isn't ultimately to do with sex. So we hear previous generations talk about deep friendship and we kind of roll our eyes and say, oh, well, they were obviously gay. Because for our culture, we just can't imagine deep intimacy that isn't ultimately to do with sex. But the Bible shows us just something very different. The Bible shows us it is possible to have lots and lots of sex and not be experiencing intimacy. I can think of a number of people I know for whom that is the case. They're looking for intimacy, but they've been trained by culture to think the way you find intimacy is through as much sexual experience as you possibly can. But sexual experience doesn't always mean intimacy. And actually in one or two cases, they're just making themselves used by others. The Bible also shows us you can have lots and lots of intimacy that is nothing to do with sex. Uh, we see that, for example, in, in the life of, of Jesus and Paul. Uh, both were single, and yet, we see both experiencing different forms of intimacy. If you read through Romans chapter 16, it, it passage we often skip over, it looks like it's the end credits to the book of Romans. There's lots of names and that kind of stuff. But it shows us that Paul operated from within a, a matrix of very deep friendships and intimacy. Uh, perhaps a, the passage that speaks the most to this is the book of Proverbs because Proverbs gives us an amazing vision of friendship. Now our culture, again, because we're putting all the focus on romantic intimacy, we've downgraded any other forms of intimacy, especially friendship. So we've turned friend from a noun into a verb. And you friend someone when you add them on Facebook, which you don't do anymore because no one uses Facebook anymore. But according to that way of thinking, a friend is someone who has access to your contact details, effectively, someone who can access your homepage. In the book of Proverbs, a friend is someone who knows your soul. Okay, the Hebrew word for friend, I'm told, is closely related to the, to the word for secret, because a friend is someone you tell your secrets to. A friend is someone who knows what's really going on in your life. A friend is someone who knows the, the inner realities of your life and not just the externalities that you 
kind of put on social media. They know what's really going on. And Proverbs shows us you can't be wise in God's world without friends. And that's as true if you are married as if you are single. I've seen some marriages implode because they had a lack of friendship around them. Uh, We see this as well in the teaching of Jesus. One of my favorite verses uh, in the Bible is, uh, it's one of those verses I would not believe was there if in fact it wasn't physically present saying what it says. It just feels too good to be true. Uh, Proverbs, sorry, John 15 verse 15 says this. Uh, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. Okay, if all you are is a servant, then certain things are, are above your pay grade, you don't have clearance for, it's not your business, you don't need to know. Jesus says, you're not that. I no longer call you servants. He says, I instead, he says, I have called you friends. This is amazing. Jesus is calling his disciples friends. He says, I call you friends for... Now, whatever Jesus says next is going to show us what Jesus believes friendship consists of. He says, I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Friendship for Jesus is spilling the beans. It's making known to the other person everything that you can make known to them. It's letting them in on what's really going on in life. In other words, in the Bible, friendship is intimacy. Intimacy in the Bible is being deeply known and deeply loved at the same time. Friendship is meant to be one of the primary categories through which we experience intimacy. Now, a question that often comes up in in discussions, particularly around um, sexuality and same-sex attraction, is, well, can I have a non-sexual romantic friendship? I'm going to honour what the Bible says by, by being celibate, but can I still have the romantic aspects of a friendship with one other person? And I want to suggest this, because this comes up a lot, that that would be, I think, profoundly unwise. Uh, One of the things we see about friendship is it has a very different architecture to marriage. Uh, Marriage requires and demands exclusivity. And the romantic expression of marriage works because of that exclusivity. Friendship neither demands nor requires exclusivity. In fact, friendship often flourishes when there isn't exclusivity. Uh, C.S. Lewis explained this beautifully in his book, The Four Loves. He was talking about how there were three of them who were kind of always hanging out together, him, Tolkien, and a guy called Charles Williams. And at one point, uh, Williams passed away. And initially, Lewis said that he thought, well, devastated as I am by the loss of of Williams, I'll get more of Tolkien now, because it'll just be the two of us. And he said, actually, what happened was the opposite. He said, I got less of Tolkien because there was so much of Tolkien that Williams brought out. And Lewis said, I'm just not, you know, I'm not big enough to draw out the whole man. There were certain things that Williams would draw out, there were certain things that I would draw out, so I actually got more of Tolkien when Williams was present. And that's how friendship works. It doesn't require exclusivity and something's going wrong with it if it's built around exclusivity. And so the notion of having a non-sexual but romantic exclusive friendship actually is a very unstable compound. You're trying to mix together two architecturally incompatible ways of relating to someone else that makes sense. And my fear is that one or the other will give. It will either not remain non-sexual or it won't remain romantic. It either needs to be marriage 
if biblically appropriate, or non-exclusive friendship, which is still a very deep form of intimacy. So the way I sometimes think about it is this, that there is a depth of intimacy that I don't experience by not being married. That depth of intimacy that exists uniquely between a husband and wife who, who spend you know, virtually their whole lives together. But being single means that I have a capacity to, to invest in a range of friendships that I wouldn't have if I was married. And so while there's a depth of intimacy I don't experience by being single, there is a breadth of intimacy I do get to experience that wouldn't be the case if I was married. So it is not the case that singleness means no intimacy. At least it shouldn't, because the Bible commends friendship to us. Well, here's the fourth and final misunderstanding. Singleness means no family. If you're single, yes, you might have a couple of friends, and that's very nice, but you won't ever have family. That's the way we often think. The gospel blows that out of the water, friends. Uh, listen to these words of Jesus. This is Mark 10, verse 28 to 30. Uh, we just had the account of the rich young man. He looked like he was the kind of ideal disciple. He kind of bounds up to Jesus. I want to kind of join up. I want to follow. Just tell me what to do and I'll get it done. Whatever I need to do to be a disciple, I will do it. Uh, Jesus calls him to leave behind certain things. And he won't. And so he walks away from the encounter sad because he's not going to be a disciple of Jesus. And we readers see him walking away and we feel sad because we're like, man, he looked like he would be such a great disciple. So it's a very kind of somber moment and Peter decides, ever the emotionally intelligent disciple, that this is the moment to show Jesus how amazing he is as a disciple. So in Mark 10, verse 28, Peter began to say to Jesus, see, we've left everything and followed you. So yeah, sad that it didn't work out with that guy, Jesus, but aren't you lucky to have us? Because we are amazing disciples. We've left everything. Jesus, you are, you are very, very welcome. You must be so relieved that we're here. And Mark tells us Peter began to say this. Evidently, Peter had much more of this material to share with Jesus. So Jesus interrupts him in verse 29 and says, truly I say to you, which is Jesus' way of saying, shut up. <laughs> and what I'm about to say is going to really, really matter. When Jesus says, truly I say to you, that means this is going to be something that people put on posters the people are embroidered on cushions. This is going to be one of those sayings. So he says, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Right. Lots of stuff going on there. Notice, firstly, Jesus assumes people will leave things to follow him. Okay, that is basic discipleship. That is what Jesus has always said. He never buries that in the small print. He's always upfront and transparent about the fact that discipleship is always going to be costly. People will leave things to follow him. Next, Jesus assumes... The most costly things to leave will be familial and relational. To the extent that some people will leave house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, even children and lands for the sake of following Jesus. For some people they will have to. Mercifully that is not the case for all of us. But we can think I'm sure of certain people who if they were to follow Jesus, they would not be able to return to their kin. They would not be able to return to their community. And yet Jesus looks at even that level of cost and says in verse 30, well, his response to that cost is not to say it's just going to be, it's just going to be terrible. But don't worry, because in the age to come, 
you get heaven. No, Jesus says even that kind of cost of discipleship is so worth it, even in this life. He says we will never leave behind for Jesus more than we receive back from him, even in this life. What we leave behind, Jesus will replace in godly kind and in far greater measure. And again, Jesus casts this in in relational and familial language. They will receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands. And yes, you get a side order of persecutions, whether you ordered that or not, that's just part of the package. Now, when Jesus talks about lands and houses, he's not saying, hey, if you become my follower, you will have an amazing property portfolio. He's talking about family. He's talking about a place where you belong. So if I can put it this way, this is, this is the real prosperity gospel. Jesus doesn't say, you give me a dollar, I'll give you back a hundred. He's saying, if you lose family for my sake, I will give you family a hundredfold. Now this is, I think, an unusual promise of Jesus because there is a, an extent to which It depends on us to fulfill it. It's easy to read this passage and think, man, Jesus is so nice giving people family. But actually we should be reading this thinking, hang on a sec, this must mean that I am the brother or sister or the mother or father or the son or daughter that Jesus is promising to those whose discipleship takes them out and away from their family. Psalm 68 says that God puts the lonely in families. And we are to be the family in which God places the lonely. So let me end with a a question for you, with a, a bit of a thought experiment. I want you to think about the church that you belong to. It can either be the church you are belonging to here at school or when you're back home uh, during the breaks. Just think about the, the church that you feel as your primary church community. I want you to imagine someone joins your church, becomes a Christian, is a follower of Jesus, but comes from a background where they are no longer welcome back in their own community. There may be someone who is from a a Muslim background, maybe someone who had been part of the gay community and is not able to return to it. Whatever it is, they're now at your church, they've lost what had been their main means of intimacy and community, and they're there on Sunday morning in your fellowship, week by week. Now, according to to Jesus in Mark 10, that person should be able to say that as a result of joining your church, maybe even as a result of joining this school, that person should be able to say, do you know what, I have way more family in my life than I ever had before. They should be able to say as a result of being in your fellowship, I have more community than I ever had before. I have more intimacy now than I ever had before. And so the question is, do you think someone would realistically say that about your church? If the answer to that question is, actually, I just don't think that would be likely. Our church has, you know, strong teaching, strong other things, but we're not really family to each other, then your church is calling Jesus a liar.
Because Jesus is saying that person will have way more family than they ever would have had had they not turned up at your church. If you can say that's true, actually, yep, our church has got any number of weaknesses and faults, but I tell you what, we really do mean it when we call each other brothers and sisters. Then your church is a demonstration that Jesus is always worth it. Even in this life, even with enormous cost to discipleship. And by implication, it is also a living demonstration of the fact that singleness in Jesus does not mean a lack of family, but quite the opposite. Actually, I have more mothers and fathers, I have more brothers and sisters, I have sons and daughters because of Christ, more than I ever would have had on my own and apart from him. So for misconceptions, I hope our own lives, I hope our own worship, I hope our own discipleship is proof that those are indeed misconceptions. Let me pray and then I'll dismiss you. Father, we pray that you would help us to live in the light of what the Bible teaches about singleness and marriage, that we would receive each as a good gift from you, that we would honour each, that we would encourage each other in these things. Help us to persevere when things are tough, either in married life or in singleness. Help us, Father, to foster healthy biblical forms of intimacy, to cultivate friendships. I pray that every student here would make friends at Cedarville that are gifts to them for the rest of their lives. And Father, we pray that we would be family to one another that there would be no one among your people who feels family-less because of their allegiance to Jesus. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. You're dismissed. Have a great day.